And this evening we've got uh, members of the cohort together, and we're going to do a uh, a little bit uh, something a little bit different. We're going to do a live workflow tutorial. Now, a little bit of pre-information on this, in that every photographer out there has their own way of doing things, and that's both good and bad. Some of the things that we do are bad habits. Some of the things that we do are good habits. And I find that we always can learn from one another when we do these hangouts and uh, pick up everybody else's good habits and drop our bad habits. But with that being said, workflow is a very personal item. We all have a tendency to do things our own ways, and that is a very good thing. Um, but this evening we're going to be doing it the way that I do it. I'm going to share with you my workflow from the point I, that I have um, converted my image from RAW to TIFF. We're not going to talk about RAW conversions in this because that is worthy of its own tutorial. Um, it is complicated enough and there are enough variations out there in software that uh, I think that we should do a, a, a raw conversion uh, tutorial as well in the future. We should do that because I don't convert anything to TIFF. I use Camera Raw all, I mean I use Adobe Camera Raw, whatever um, Canon's version is up until until I decide that I'm going to export it somewhere but I always leave it in uh, raw. Right. Um, are you are you talking about doing this in Lightroom or in Photoshop? If I do it in Lightroom, I, I leave it in, in RAW throughout. If I take it into Photoshop, when I leave Photoshop, I turn it into a TIFF file. Okay, all right. Or a PSD file, but usually TIFF. Well, believe it or not, um, when you run the, your image through uh, ACR, it actually creates a TIFF file that Photoshop's editing. Okay. You cannot actually edit a DNG or a RAW file. Um, the, the camera gods above have made rules that we're not allowed to break. So the software developers say, okay, we just won't tell you we've created a TIFF. Oh, secrets. Secrets, yes. We love our secrets. So anyways, um, I'm going to walk us through three images. Uh, two of mine in one secret image from one of you. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Uh um, and the secret image was a problem image that one of you were having, so we're going to go through that to the best of our ability as well. Um, but having said that, um, I am going to share my desktop with you right now. Here we go. And I am going to bring up my page, and I am going to show you um, my output directory. This is just where I store my raw converted images, whether I convert in ACR or um, Capture One, which is where I really do my converting. Um, I, I do the conversions. And then I save them in a working directory where I can go back to later on and pull out the ones that I, that I desire to edit. And as you can see, I have lots of them in here to edit. Um, but, I, you know, I travel a lot. So I, I, what, I, what I do is my first stage of editing is to go through and delete the images that are absolutely useless to me. Okay. And then what I will do is I will go through and I will pick my favorite images. Um, for instance, I am doing a series of images on old dilapidated fishing boats um, from the back end up. Okay, uh, if we were shooting nature shots, we would say these were bird butt shots. Okay, um, and this just gives you an example. This this one has already been raw converted to a TIFF as you can see here and it's waiting for me to edit it. So then at my leisure then I will go through and I will pick an image that I that I desire to edit like this one and run it through 
my workflow, which is what we're going to get into now. This is my post processing workflow, okay? And as I said, should you have any questions, please speak up while we are doing them. So I have two images loaded. Um, can anybody tell me what this image is of, please? Crab pots. Yep. yep. These were a stack of crab pots on a dock overlooking the Pamlico Sound in Swan Quarter uh, from one of my workshops last month. And I like crab pots. They're colorful, uh, they're vibrant, uh, they're, they're unique things, and I will always try and do something different, which is what I did here. Uh, the, this stack was about five crab pots high, and I grabbed two and I threw on the top at an angle like this. I positioned these crab pots here strategically to frame this little tiny tree in the background. Now, having done that was really kind of a stupid thing because the tree really was too small to be of any general use in the image. But the artistic concept was kind of cool, don't you think? Well, maybe yeah. not. Yes. Okay. So, for my workflow, I've done the raw conversion. I've saved it into my output directory. I have opened it up using uh, Bridge and dumped it into Photoshop. And this is the initial entry into the post-processing. The very first thing I will do is I will look at the image and decide upon any crops that I want to make. And I will do those first. And the reason that I do the crops uh, simply is that by removing real estate, that's less area I have to clean and deal with things like dust spots on the sensors. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to crop this. Uh, let's go in. I'm going to crop this to my master size, which is eight and a half by twelve and a half inches. Uh, the reason that I chose that is because most digital cameras are going to give you a out of camera file size somewhere in that range up to um, say 12 by 16 or 12 by 17. All right. Um, now the newer the cameras, the higher the resolution, the greater the, 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 the uh, resolution so that we can have a larger file. The reason it's eight and a half by 12 and a half was so that I could put it in a eight by 12 matted print. And as you know, when you mat a print, you have to have the mat overlay the image by at least a quarter inch on each edge. Okay. <coughs> Hence the eight and a half by 12 and a half. Okay. Now for this image, I, I, I like the colors, I like the composition, but I don't like this open area of sky. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to crop that out. I'm going to crop down to where I can take this out and I'm going to position this something like this. And I'm going to put that tree dead center, okay? I'm not looking for the normal rule of thirds. I'm not looking um, uh, to have the main subject centered or off to one side. I'm looking for that bullseye for the tree. Okay. Now when I'm, when I'm done cropping this, I've used the crop tool and I've set it up here for 12 and a half by eight and a half. I have said, make it 300 DPI. Okay, 300 pixels per inch. It's important that you set these things. Otherwise, when you do the crop, you could actually damage the image to a point. And I'm going to click return, and this is where I'm at for my starting point. I'm going to blow it up so that it's full screen. And then once I've done this crop, I will go through and I will do a basic check for dust spots on the sensor. Um, this, these are going to show up in the sky and in lightly colored water and on the edge of bright fishing boat halls, okay? 
I'm looking for chromatic aberrations. I'm not seeing any of those. Okay, and those are something that you remove during the raw conversion as well. Okay, it looks pretty good. I don't really see any sensor spots, so let's make it fit the screen again. I'm going to go on to my first processing step after cropping, and that is noise reduction. For my choice of noise reduction uh, software is I like to find two. And I will always run it very first thing right off the bat, and I will let it run in the automatic mode. If we see up here in the setup, it says automatic, and down here it said automatic profile is applied, and if I run my mouse across the screen, and where we're going to see the noise is in the blue sky. Look down in the lower right-hand corner. It's split in half. The, the left-hand half is uncorrected. The right-hand half is corrected. Now, given that this is streaming video, can you anybody tell me, can you see the noise in the left-hand half of that preview? Not really. Okay. Um, trust me, here on my computer screen, it is there. There is a definite salt and pepper pattern in that sky. And the automatic mode of define has removed it. Now, if there were more serious noise issues, then I could go into the manual mode. All right, but we, we'll talk about that a little bit later in this. And I'm simply now going to go down and say, okay. And the Nick filter is going to create an adjustment layer. This is a non-destructive um, editing layer where we have done our noise reduction. All right. Now, given that we are dealing with a color image, uh, from a very high dynamic range camera. This is from the uh, M240 camera system, and it has a dynamic range of 13.17, uh, which is not too shabby. Um, I might normally go in now at this point and run Viviza, but most of the time when I'm shooting color images, I find that the Color Effects Pro can sometimes be a very good starting point uh, for this next step of my post processing. And I'm going to bring up Color Effects Pro and I'm going to simply look at some of these recipes down the left hand side. The first one I like to look at is called the Contrast Color Range. And you, you, you click on it and it, it applies some basic changes to the image. But what you have to do with this filter, see this color slider up here on the right-hand top? You have to slide this, and it's going to select the, the base color groups it is going to work on. All right, so see how the image changes as I, as I move this? And I'm looking at, at the blues and the reds. When I find something that I like, I can do a before and after by clicking on the check mark up here. This is after. This is before. See the changes that it's made? It's not too shabby. Sometimes color um, contrast range can be a bit much. I've seen what it can do. Now I'm going to go down and I'm going to look at another filter called Tonal Contrast, which is one I also like. The difference between tonal contrast and color contrast is the color contrast works on color shades. Tonal works on tonal shades, highlights, midtones, and shadows. And as I move the highlight slider, it's going to change the things in the white areas. And it's, as you can see, there's not a lot of bright white there, so it's not doing a lot. So now let's go down to the midtone and watch what happens here. This is making quite a bit of change as I go from one end to the other, um, especially in the ocean water. Now watch the shadow range. Um, by going down in shadows, I'm actually losing contrast. So let's look at this before and after. And that's actually quite pleasing, don't you think? 
Yeah. Okay. Now, another nice thing about um, Color Effects Pro is you can stack filters. We can add filter by clicking on this little button here. And now I can go in and I can check out some other filters on top of the tonal contrast that I've already applied. First thing I'm going to look at is the white neutralizer, and I'm going to turn it on and off. And what this is going to do is change the colors of the whites. Um, with it on, it's the image is much colder. There's less warmth in it. Uh, I don't care for that in terms of this image, so I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to go up and I'm going to check out one more filter called Detail Extractor. Now, you got to be careful with Detail Extractor. A little bit of this goes a long, long way. Um, so I've got it turned on. I'm going to run the, the, the detail slider down, if I can grab a hold of it. So down here, it's off. And as I start to bring this up, it is going to bring out some detail highlights in the image. But in all honesty, in looking at this image, it really doesn't need this. So I'm going to click the, the, the detail extractor off, and that's all I'm going to do here in color effects. So I'll say OK, and what it's going to do is it's going to build another adjustment layer on top of Define. And I can turn the eye off on this, and you can see the before and after. Now, notice the histogram. See the, the rise in the histogram? It affects the amount of color and contrast, but not the spread of the color and contrast, OK? Um, at this point, I would check my noise again and maybe run Vivisa and do some small touch-up work. So let's just do that. Let's bring up Vivisa. I'm going to make it full screen. And I'm going to work on this float inside this crab pot. I am going to go right in here in this red area. I'm going to add structure, which is kind of a micro sharpening. I might try bumping up the saturation. Yeah, I'm going to bump up the saturation just. Okay, let's talk about this one. Questions? When you when you add control points, when you group them together like that, it holds that last <laughs> command until you add a new group. Is that correct? Yes. And so I typically have been trying to get the control point, you know, like when you just did the Miss Peaches, you, you shrunk your control point down just to cover that area. But on other areas... You didn't care. Is there? You're not worried about over brightening. Well, the, the the peach that I was trying to change was small, and there wasn't any other peachy colored things in the area, so I didn't have to worry about it. When I was doing the bows of the boat, I made the the, the control point larger to cover the entire area. Now, for instance, that bow was blue and there was some blue water and there was some blue paint on the other boats, it would affect those blues as well. If you take another control point and drop on those other blue areas, it's called an anchor point. And it'll take those back to where they started from, but yet leave your edits on the bow of the boat alone. So anchor points are important too. Okay. Now, like I said, this is just my personal recipe for workflow. I go through this on every image I do. Yes, the black and whites are different, and we will have a separate workflow for black and whites because it's much more involved, believe it or not. It is. It's much, much more work. So when, you, when you're using the same... Um, when you're doing your color work in the Nick tool, um, do you just option copy each one? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay. You okay. Hold the, if you're on a Mac, you hold the option key down and you click on the control point. And then you just option and drag. And move it aside. Yeah. 
and where you move it, it, it copies all of your edits. Cool. Now you can also group control points. Like you saw me put the, the, the change of structure in the cloud across multiple control points. I could have grouped all of those together and then just changed one adjustment and affected all of them. Oh, nice. Okay. How do you, how do you group in that? I'll show you that in, in the last image that we're going to work on. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Is any of this helpful? Yeah, your, um, your workflow is backwards from mine. <laughs> like I said, everybody's everybody's individual. Because <laughs> the last thing I do is denoise and sharpen and all that stuff. And I take out spots after I find them, which is usually after I've saved it and made the file sizes. Do you know why I do it the opposite way as you do? Yeah, I do now. <laughs> sort of, because, yeah, it's less messy. Yeah, it's less messy. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go to the next image. I'm going to go back to screen share. And I now know that I need to look for chromatic aberrations first. Yes, you got to do I'll that go. during the raw conversion. And I guess I should start doing the raw conversion. And you can make that, and it doesn't matter what you use. Yeah, but Adobe Camera Raw got rid of it in one click, and I could never get rid of it in Lightroom. Sure you could. There's no, I played with it for a ha I played with it all morning. Well, uh, Camera Raw has more, um, it refines it a little bit better. Oh, okay. But I just couldn't get it, I could not get it to go away. Yeah. But that new one that I'm using is even better. Which one? Oh, is that, um, the one that uh, Picture Ninja by uh, Noise Ninja. Oh, Noise yeah. Ninja? That was the other one. Oh, it's called Picture. I pulled that up because Elon was talking about it, fell in love. I'm done with Camera Raw. They have a free trial, too. Yeah, that's what I did. And I'm just like, okay. You have to stop showing me stuff because I bought stuff yesterday. Do the free, do the free the trial because I ended up buying it. I oh. said, well, let's just go for it. Come on, Rhonda, you spend money all the time. That's what I'm trying not to do. Okay, can uh, I tell can I say what's wrong with this? What my issue is with this? Sure, but I want you to tell us about the image first. This 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 is Do there. you know this image, Rhonda? I have seen this somewhere. It's in your neck of the woods. It's over it's off of Old Mountain Road, isn't it? Behind New Hope? It's in New Hope. Definitely. It's by the trains, mm -hmm. but you have to hike back behind and down the way, and they've yeah. got several of them. So that's where we stumbled on this one. I have a picture of a um, of a chair inside of a train. We mm -hmm. went up in the train, and I'll do that one one day. I, I, but it's just we can't. We went back and we couldn't get in that. But anyway, that's where this is. Well, what you need to do is climb up here in the boiler and sit and have someone take your portrait. Yes. Uh, no. I'll do that. No. I'll do that when you come down. Okay. Mm -hmm. Not climbing up. I climbed up in that other one and took a picture. Not of me. Did you go in the one with the um, with the graffiti monsters? But you have to be. I don't know which one that one was. If you saw them, you you'd recognize them. They're creepy. Oh, but um, you got to be really careful because some of them are made out of wood, and there's holes. And but it's interesting, needless mm -hmm. to say. So when I saw this, I fell in love with this particular thing because it looks like something from Mad Max. Mm -hmm. And that was like, ooh. Not that I don't like the other ones, but this is different. Yeah, this is one of the high-speed steam engines that's just rusted away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it that was like the thing I liked because of the color of the rust. And you have to know that I took this when it was 18 degrees. Yeah, I can see the snow on the grounds. That proves that you're out in the cold. I do do the cold. You saw my frozen waterfall, right? Yes. So I do cold. I don't do hot as much. I don't know what that is. We'll fix that for you. Yeah. Hot is miserable. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was out today and it was humid. Okay. Well, you were asking about chromatic aberrations. That in the corner over there, the right corner at the top, no matter what you do, it gets worse, worse, worse. Yeah, I know. I'll show you how to fix that. Anyways, you go to lens corrections. Um, you could there. You, I would enable the lens profile correction. You see what that does? Mm -hmm. Look at the corner. But you start working on it, and it starts to come back. No, no, no. Well, yeah. I, I'm going to show you. Okay. Did you Turn have a polarizer off. filter on for that? Because it no. 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 Then Here. click on color and click remove chromatic aberrations. Okay. Add a little bit of purple because that's where it's at. Ah, it's in the purple. Um, yeah. So that's why I couldn't figure it out. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to go back over here to my main thing. And I am going to go and I'm going to check your white balance. You do what you want to do. Uh, I'm going to expose. Oh, look at that. Well, if you look at the one that I have, you'll see it's that color. Yeah. But you got to remember it was 18 degrees and cold. So yeah, those it's... trees weren't looking, were looking exactly like that, but I like that still. This is what you actually saw. Yes. Not the trees. Yeah. The, the engine. So I played with that to bring that out. But I like the coldness at the same time. But you notice what's happening? I don't know if it's showing on your screen or not. The noise. purple's popping. Magenta. The Is it magenta popping? Like noise. Yeah. Well, see, my first step is to go in, get rid of spots, get rid of the CA um, crop, get rid of lines that I don't like, these lines going through here because they're distracting to me. Mm -hmm. And then I denoise it or define it or whatever program that seems to work the best. Then I go in and I start dealing with the colors and things like that. All right. Well, let's get through this stage here. I, I have moved your white balance from 4,800 up to 5,800. Okie dokie. Because that gives me the best cross between the red and the white of the snow and still maintaining some blue sky up here. Okay. Bluish gray. Um, I'm going to add just a touch of contrast. I'm going to look at the highlights real quick. See, now I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that in Camera Raw. I I would deal with that in another program. Yeah, but I know. But we're what we're doing is Mark's workflow. Oops. <laughs> Not Sherry's. Oops. Yeah. This is not Sherry's workflow. This Oops. is Sherry couldn't get the corner not not weird, so Whoops. <laughs> Oops, baby. Um now I'm what I'm doing is I'm moving the highlight slatter, but I am watching the histogram. Mm -hmm. I'm not really watching the image. I'm gonna do the same with the shadows. bring out just a little detail whites now I'm going to give it a little bit of color clarity all right which is micro sharpening but now the vibrance you have to be very careful with it's messing with that corner again yeah no, no, the corner's fine. Okay. Okay, maybe it's my screen. All right. Um, but this will bring back chromatic aberration or enhance it. So a little bit of vibrance goes a long way. Now, right now, I've got a nice pale baby blue sky happening right here. There's, I, I have no problems with the sky up here at this point. You notice down here I've got this set to 16-bit, 300 dpi. You need to set this once when you're running this program, and it'll remember it. 16 bits per channel, Adobe RGB 1998. 
um, da, 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 300 DPI. And I'm going to say open the image. Now I am doing the raw conversion. I am building a TIFF file. And we dump the TIFF file into Adobe, even though it still says DNG. Uh, what camera did you take this with, Sherry? Uh, Canon, the Mark II. Okay. Do you mind telling me how I ended up with a DNG instead of a, a, a CRW? Yeah, real easy. I load my stuff up through the bridge into a backup drive, and I convert it to DNG. You don't do any editing. You just do a straight one-to-one -one conversion. Yes. Perfect. Can't argue with that. Um, I'm going to go in and I'm going to just look around real quick. Um, things that I see that I would want to do. Um, I wouldn't do anything with these electric lines because that's just too much trouble. I've done that. Um, but you could remove these. You could, you, you could clone these out or uh, fill them. Um, but for the purposes of this image, we're not going to do any of that, okay? This did a really nice raw conversion. I'm seeing detail inside the boiler. See that? I couldn't see that before. I've got good detail in the, in the wheels. We have, look at this, we have fall leaves. Mm -hmm. Under the tracks. Mm -hmm. um, okay, that looks pretty good. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is I am not going to run Color Effects Pro. I am going to go up and I'm going to just jump right into Visa because it's much more powerful. And what I'm going to do is I am going to do a control point here. And I'm going to go into my hue and I'm going to select this blue. Okay? And I'm mm -hmm. going to I'm going to lighten it up because the sun is brighter over on this side. Okay? I don't want a white sky. I want a slightly blue sky. You didn't do a noise reduction, is that because this one just didn't need it? No, that's because I forgot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, in all honesty, I did. I just forgot. As we go more to the left of the page, we have to brighten it, okay? And I'm seeing a slight green tint. Okay, I don't like that. Let's do that again. Now, let's go up into this corner. This is your trouble corner. And you don't like it because it was dark in this corner. Correct? Yeah, it was kind of, it just kind of, when you started working with it, just went strange. Right. I'm just going to put a small control point here. And I'm going to add just a level of brightness. Okay, just a wee bit till I have it to where I want it. Okay. And I want to work over here in between these trees. Look at that green. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Do you notice I got a sweep of blue across the sky now? I don't have any dark spots in this corner. Okay. I, I have this kind of this baby blue thing happening over here. Let's bump the saturation down a little there. Let's go over here and do the same here. Just bring the saturation. Down. But I'm just looking for that baby blue wash across the entire top of the image. And just that fast, I got it. Okay. So far, so good. Let's see I if did, maintain. I did, oh, no. We're, we're done with the sky. Okay. Oh, have some faith. I have faith. Okay. That's why I asked you. Now I'm going to take a control point, and I'm going to drop it on the tree. 
and I'm going to lower my saturation of that tree trunk just a bit and I might try darkening yeah yep yep oh baby oh baby yep yep that works for me now let's do it to this one here oh yeah I like that over here darken that And I'm going to take some saturation more out of that. Yeah, I like that. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to leave the train alone for now. I'm going to go down here and I'm going to work on this ugly road, okay? First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to select this, this dry area here. See this? I'm going to put a control point there and I'm going to totally desaturate it. Okay? And I'm just going to kind of copy this around, this, these bright areas that are dry. I'm going to take all the saturation away. There's one over here. And now I'm going to do the same thing here in the dark areas. But guess what? You're going to brighten it. No, I'm going to darken it. Darken it, okay. Okay, and I'm going to add structure. I want those, those rocks to come out. And I'm going to copy that down the road. Okay. We need some over here. We need some here. We need some way back here. Okay. Now I'm going to go over here to, to under the tracks. Okay. See, I brought back. I have brought back the color of the leaves. I'm going to punch the structure up. I'm going to bring the saturation up. Maybe just a, a touch of, yeah, the warmth. I want to just get a hint of those leaves under the wheels there. See what I'm doing? Just like that. That's all I need, just a hint of those old dry leaves. Now, these four wheels, I'm going to treat different than everything else on this undercarriage. For these wheels, I'm going to select the wheel. I'm going to give it structure to bring out detail, and I'm going to desaturate it. Okay? And I'm going to shrink that size down a little. And I'm going to do this to every single of these wheels. Okay. And that back one, I'm going to add a little bit of brightness to these back too, because they're shiny. They should look shiny, don't you think? And there's a bit of shine on this wheel here and here. Okay. Now everything else in this undercarriage I'm going to treat differently. I'm going to go up here to the main steam pistons. You see that in my lower window down in the right hand corner? See the blues and the silvers mm -hmm. and the rust? I'm going to enhance that by increasing the structure on that. Okay. I'm just going to copy this around on the steam piston because this is just way cool. It's just a cool train. Okay. And these black wheels here, these guys are going to get a little bit of shadow adjustments to bring out some details in them. See? And this guy here needs it too. All oh, that is just so cool. Okay. Now let's go to the inside of the boiler and add just not much because a little bit of this goes a long way there and it actually makes it look noisy so you have to add a, a touch of contrast and sometimes you can just do it with structure too okay and this tree needs darkened more
because it's taking my eye off the train because the tree is becoming a problem, okay? I really like the effect of the road. I like that we've brought the leaf colors out here from the fall leaves that are dead and frozen. We've desaturated the road. We don't need color there to take our eyes away from the train. We've enhanced the color of the, of the main steam pistons. Now we're going to work on the, the, the boiler, the outside boiler. And with this, the first tool that we're going to use is structure. See that? And I'm going to increase the saturation. And I'm going to simply walk this down the train. Down here, it needs a little bit different treatment. Uh, this needs a wee bit more structure. Oh, boy, I wish I could see this train. You want to come up and I'll take you? I am going to get up there. I, I am. I think I'm going to brighten the coal car. And now I'm going to put one last control point here on the side of the car. I'm going to add structure because I want the textures and I am going to slowly decrease the saturation on that. Yeah. And maybe bring up the brightness a bit. Just a little. Okay. Let's look at this. See if there's anything else that needs... I'm going to put an anchor point here because my um, adjustment of this, this forward carried has brightened this up. Okay. So you're going to bring that back down. Yeah. Because it, it, it becomes a distraction. Like the tree back over here in the back behind the coal. You know, they bother those, me too. Those are so far away. Let's look at those. Let's put a control point on there. <clears throat> and let's take some saturation away from that. You got to be careful because it becomes more of a blur than a tree. A little bit of this goes a real long way. There. Um, now, I've got one more thing that I need to do. You see these dark, oily areas here? Mm -hmm. Those need our special touch. I'll start right here, and I am going to darken that. See that? And I'm just going to walk this wherever there's dark areas, like right in here. There's some up here. I want to bring that contrast back. Okay. Now, do I want to add some brightness down here? Let's look at that. Yeah, that works pretty good. Yeah. Let's go back to these dark areas. I want to enhance those dark areas. Um, now, I would also take the time and clone this electrical line out. This line's too much of an issue. Okay. Well, let's say okay with this and take a look see at, at what we got for before and after. We did a lot of editing in this Fivesa. Okay, so let's let's look at before and after. Look at the sky. You see what I've done to that sky? Mm -hmm. Look at the undercarriage of the train here. 
this almost comes out as a supporting subject now it's separate from the boiler it has dimension the, this whole training's taken on a three-dimensional feel before see how that undercarriage just pops out at you now oh I like this I love how this train turned out I really do could you have backed any further away from the train I would have been in a little creek was there anything behind you you could stand on to get a higher viewpoint, a higher vantage? Oh, well, I had threatened to take a ladder. Okay. Don't you but, have Leo's so you can get in the water? No, it was I froze in almost. Stand on the water. Well, you could have walked on it then. Exactly. I said almost. Okay. But um, no, I threatened to bring a ladder because those wheels were at least five feet. I mean, this was a humongous, this All right. is a humongous train. All right. We're not done yet. It's just, it's just gorgeous. Now we're going to bring up Color Effects Pro one last time. I Let's just want to look and see if it can further enhance this image. What are we going to? Um, we are going to. I'm going to start with uh, color contrast range first. I'm going to move the slider. It's probably going to be way overdone for my likes. Yep, it is. Don't like that. I'm going to go to tonal contrast. See what tonal contrast has done to the train, but n not much else? I can't. I'm not getting a good feed at this moment. Okay. So yeah. I can't tell. I'm going to bring the highlights down. Okay, because I just don't want anything in that sky. Now let's play with the midtones, which is the, the boiler and the trees. Now let's look at the shadows. Oh, boy, did that That's ever it. The boy, shadows. That. Now let's do before and after. Oh, yeah, that, that really... Aided. Now let's add a filter and see. Um, <laughs> let's try detail first. We probably don't need any. It's one of my favorite filters. Actually, a little bit of detail does further enhance that train a bit. Even that's probably too much. All right, let's go with that and then let's look at our white neutralizer to see if that improves our image. And it actually it improves the sky. Do you see that? No. The sky becomes a, a constant baby blue, but it adds a blue tint to everything else. So I'm going to say no to that. We're just going to go with what we did. Mark, would you consider maybe doing a little bit of a graduated filter for the sky if it was? Mm -mm. You, you could. I think, but mm. so, so this is. I'm just thinking this is that all I tried that. Effective. No, no, it's not that it's, it wouldn't be nice. It's just I tried that, and it seemed to make the sky wacky. All right, so let's turn this on and off. Look at how that boiler just glows. So we can put some glamour glow on it. <laughs> no, no. That's that would, junky. That would soften it. The only thing that I find horridly distracted into these lines. But, yeah. you know, they're the bear, you know, and they're going to get you here, so. Oh, I do like this. So let's take the layers. Let's merge them down. Let's save this as a PSD. So you always flatten yours? Uh, I, I do because I'm going to send it back to you and it's too big to send over the internet. What's the name of this engine? 
Steam Engine? Oh no, there's got to be a name on it somewhere. It's in a Mexican. We couldn't find it. It's in, it's in a, it's from Mexico because I put it on the um, the railroad section. Mm -hmm. And someone that got the information that it was some kind of steam engine from the 1930s or 40s from Mexico. That's all I know. All right, so that's saved on my desktop. It better be saved on my desktop. Where did I save that at? Oh God, I saved that in the iPad directory. <laughs> so it's your image now, huh? It, well, no, it's 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 the full size image. It's just in the iPad directory now. Let's say a small version of it for you. We're going to put that on the desktop where it's supposed to be. Change it into a JPG. Save it. Okay, so that's done. That's done. We are done with Photoshop. Now let's go to the iPad directory and move that other one out of there. PSD, see? Put that on the desktop. Did that move to the desktop? I don't know. Okay. Stop the screen share. I'm back. Hi. Hi. Let me shrink me down and go to my desktop and see if I can find... So that's going to get trashed. There's your PSD. I, I'm, I'm going to delete your DNG. Goodbye, DNG. It's gone. So, question about raw uh, CR versus DNG. Oh, well, there's nothing wrong with the DNGs. It's, it's, it is a universal raw file. You're fine running it through a DNG converter. You really are. Now, my camera doesn't save CRWs or RAWs. It saves DNGs right in the camera. That's your... Both, both of the Leicas do that. The yeah, well, my Leica does that, but... Well, that's how we feel about you. <laughs> kind of lost you there for a minute. Did I? Was I gone? Yeah. Oh. Okay. So that's just kind of, I don't know how I got into the habit of it, but I started set, uh, pulling things up through, um, through the bridge and just going directly into my uh, backup drive and saving everything that way. Mm -hmm. as opposed to doing a catalog with Lightroom and all of that. Yeah, I don't, I don't use Lightroom catalogs. I do everything through Bridge. And I, get a, I just name a folder and, and that's it. Yeah, let me show you uh, real quick. It's just another, just another thing, right? Always. Mm-hmm. Seems you learn something, you get rid of something else. You you bet. All right. So let's go here. I got to think about where I put these. Okay. If I go to my Macintosh H drive, I go to users, I go to me, I go to pictures. I go down to raw image library. Okay. <clears throat> All right. This is my 2004 raw images, my or my 2014 and my 2015. 
Now let me arrange this by name. And I want you to notice that I have camera names in here. iPhone, my scanner Epson V8850, M240, MM is for monochrome, Nikon 120, X-T1, and I have an infrared and IR X100S. Okay, these directories with months are videos. Okay. Um, if I go into an M240 directory, then it's further subdivided by month. Okay. If I go into the month, then if you look at my files, let's go into this. Okay. This is the file name of my raw files that are brought into my computer. M240 camera name, the four digit serial number the camera assigns, and then I have my shutter speed defined in there and I do that for a very specific reason. And then a job code. This picture was taken on my California trip on Tuesday. As we go on down here, okay, um, I have other job codes. This is just California, California, San Francisco. Okay. These are my raw files that are brought into the computer from the camera memory card. These are not the, the file names as named by the camera. Have you noticed that? Mm -hmm. I have a utility <clears throat> called Ingestomatic right here. that will read my camera memory card will rename everything build the directory structure if it's not already there now it's September it will put the September directory in for me when the years change it will automatically change to 2016 and start building all those structures again automatically for me <clears throat> this is my primary root directory. This is where it, my raw library starts. Users, Mark Hilliard, pictures, raw, image library, and capture. Underneath that, oh, and it also will back up to external drives, up to two of them at, at one time while you're reading them in. It'll make backups for you. <clears throat> Underneath that, I have a folder arrangement that I have programmed here with tokens and it gives us macro tokens we can choose these things to, to, to change the file name change the folder names we can use any of these things okay so under under my raw library capture the very first thing that I have is it makes a directory of the year this is my 2015 directory if it's not there, it makes it. Then it looks up the camera model number in the image file itself. And it makes that the So those of you who shoot multiple cameras, this is a way to set up your raw library by the camera. And then the next thing it does is it puts the, the, the three-character month code in. August. Now into this, or September, okay, into this it's going to drop the camera files into this August directory, but it's going to change the name of the camera files intelligently. It's going to look up the, the camera model, so the very first thing it will say is Leica M240. Then it's going to put a dash in, and then it's going to take the original file number of that file and it's going to clip everything else off and throw it away and put that file, that four-digit file number in here because it's that four-digit file number that we use to organize our images. And then I've told it that I want uh, the shutter speed. Okay, so I've told it dash speed. And I said look up the exposure time in the file. It go gets it for every file. 
and then it's going to tack on a job code. It's going to prompt me for this job code every time I upload a memory card into my computer, so I can give it something specific that tells me where I shot at. And then it's going to put the four-year date, uh, the numerical code. Inside of a train. We went up in the train, and I'll do that one one day. I'm, I'm, but it's just, we, can't, we went back and we couldn't get in that. But anyway, that's where this is. Well, what you need to do is climb up here in the boiler and sit and have someone take your portrait. Yes. Uh, no. I'll do that. No. I'll do that when you come down. Okay. Mm -hmm. Not climbing up. I climbed up in that other one and took a picture. Not of me. Did you go in the one with the, um, with the graffiti monsters? But you have to be, I don't know which one that one was. If you saw them, you'd, you'd recognize them. They're creepy. Oh, yeah. But um, you got to be really careful because some of them are made out of wood and there's holes. And, but it's interesting, needless mm -hmm. to say. So when I saw this, I fell in love with this particular thing because it looks like something from Mad Max. Mm -hmm. And that was like, ooh. Not that I don't like the other ones, but this is different. Yeah, this is one of the high-speed steam engines that's just rusted away. Yeah. And that was the thing I liked because of the color of the rust. And you have to know that I took this when it was 18 degrees. Yeah, I can see the snow on the grounds. So that proves that you're out in the cold. I do do the cold. You saw my frozen waterfall, right? Yes. So I do cold. I don't do hot as much. I don't know what that is. We'll fix that for you. Yeah. Hot is miserable. Yeah. I was out today and it was humid. Okay. Well, you were asking about chromatic aberrations. That in the corner over there, the right corner at the top, no matter what you do, it gets worse, worse, worse. Yeah, I know. I'll show you how to fix that. Anyways, you go to lens corrections. Um, you could there you I would enable the lens profile correction. Do you see what that does? Mm -hmm. Look at the corner. But you start working on it and it starts to come back. No, no, no. Well, no. I, I'm going to show you. Okay. Did you Turn have a polarizer off. filter on for that? Cause it, no. No? No. Then Here. click on color and click remove chromatic aberrations. Okay. Add a little bit of purple because that's where it's at. Ah, it's in the purple. Um, yeah. So that's why I couldn't figure it out. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to go back over here to my main thing. And I am going to go and I'm going to check your white balance. You do what you want to do. Uh, I'm going to expose. Oh, look at that. Well, if you look at the one that I have, you'll see it's that color. Yeah. But you got to remember it was 18 degrees and cold. So yeah, those it. trees weren't looking were looking exactly like that, but I like that still. This is what you actually saw. Yes. Not the trees. Yeah. The the engine. So I played with that to bring that out. But I like the coldness at the same time. But you notice what's happening? I don't know if it's showing on your screen or not. The noise. purple's popping. Magenta. The Is it magenta popping? Like noise. Yeah. Well, see, my first step is to go in, get rid of spots, get rid of the CA um, crop, get rid of lines that I don't like, these lines going through here because they're distracting to me. Mm -hmm. And then I denoise it or define it or whatever program that seems to work the best. Then I go in and I start dealing with the colors and things like that. All right. Well, let's get through this stage here. I, I have moved your white balance from 4,800 up to 5,800. Okie dokie. Because that gives me the best cross between the red and the white of the snow and still maintaining some blue sky up here. Okay. Bluish gray. Um, I'm going to add just a touch of contrast. 
I'm going to look at the highlights real quick. See, now I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that in Camera Raw. I I would deal with that in another program. Yeah, but I know. But we're what we're doing is Mark's workflow. Oops, <laughs> not Sherry's. Oops. Yeah. This is not Sherry's workflow. This Whoops. is Sherry couldn't get the corner not not weird. So whoops, <laughs> whoops, there it is. Um, now I'm what I'm doing is I'm moving the highlight slider, but I am watching the histogram. Mm -hmm. I'm not really watching the image. I'm going to do the same with the shadows. Bring out just a little detail. Whites. Now, I'm going to give it a little bit of color clarity. All right, which is micro sharpening. But now, the vibrance you have to be very careful with. It's, it's messing with that corner again, yeah. No, no, the corner's fine. Okay. Okay, maybe it's my screen. All right. Um, but this will bring back chromatic aberration or enhance it. So a little bit of vibrance goes a long way. Now, right now, I've got a nice pale baby blue sky happening right here. There's, I, I have no problems with the sky up here at this point. You notice down here I've got this set to 16-bit, 300 dpi. You need to set this once when you're running this program, and it'll remember it. 16 bits per channel, Adobe RGB 1998, um, da -da -da, 300 dpi. And I'm going to say open the image. Now I am doing the raw conversion. I am building a TIFF file. And we dump the TIFF file into Adobe, even though it still says DNG. Uh, what camera did you take this with, Sherry? Uh, Canon, the Mark II. Okay. Do you mind telling me how I ended up with a DNG instead of a, a, a CRW? Yeah, real easy. I load my stuff up through the bridge into a backup drive, and I convert it to DNG. You don't do any editing. You just do a straight one-to-one -one conversion. Yes. Perfect. Can't argue with that. Um, I'm going to go in and I'm going to just look around real quick. Um, things that I see that I would want to do. Um, I wouldn't do anything with these electric lines because that's just too much trouble. I've done that. Um, but you could remove these. You could, you, you could clone these out or uh, fill them. Um, but for the purposes of this image, we're not going to do any of that, okay? This did a really nice raw conversion. I'm seeing detail inside the boiler. See that? I couldn't see that before. I've got good detail in the, in the wheels. We have, look at this, we have fall leaves. Mm -hmm. Under the tracks. Mm -hmm. um, okay, that looks pretty good. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is I am not going to run Color Effects Pro. I am going to go up and I'm going to just jump right into Visa because it's much more powerful. And what I'm going to do is I am going to do a control point here. And I'm going to go into my hue and I'm going to select this blue. Okay, and I'm mm -hmm. going to I'm going to lighten it up because the sun is brighter over on this side. Okay. I don't want a white sky. I want a slightly blue sky. You didn't do a noise reduction, is that because this one just didn't need it? No, that's because I forgot. Okay. <laughs> okay, in all honesty, I did. I just forgot. As we go more to the left of the page, we have to brighten it, okay? And I'm seeing a slight green tint.
Okay, I don't like that. Let's do that again. Now let's go up into this corner. This is your trouble corner. And you don't like it because it was dark in this corner. Correct? Yeah, it was kind of, it just kind of, when you started working with it, it just went strange. Right. I'm just going to put a small control point here. And I'm going to add just a level of brightness. Okay, just a wee bit till I have it to where I want it. Okay. And I want to work over here in between these trees. Look at that green. Oh my goodness. Okay. Do you notice I got a sweep of blue across the sky now? I don't have any dark spots in this corner. Okay, I, I have this kind of this baby blue thing happening over here. Let's bump the saturation down a little there. Let's go over here and do the same here. Just bring the saturation. Down. And I'm just looking for that baby blue wash across the entire top of the image. And just that fast, I got it. Okay. So and far, I, so good. Let's see I if did, maintain. I did, oh, no. We're, we're done with the sky. Okay. Oh, have some faith. I have faith. Okay. That's why I asked you. Now I'm going to take a control point, and I'm going to drop it on the tree. And I'm going to lower my saturation of that tree trunk just a bit. And I might try darkening. Yeah. Yep, yep. Oh, baby, oh, baby. Yep, yep. That works for me. Now let's do it to this one here. Oh, yeah. I like that over here. Darken that. And I'm going to take some saturation more out of that. Yeah, I like that. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to leave the train alone for now. I'm going to go down here and I'm going to work on this ugly road, okay? First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to select this, this dry area here. See this? I'm going to put a control point there and I'm going to totally desaturate it. Okay? And I'm just going to kind of copy this around, this, these bright areas that are dry. I'm going to take all the saturation away. There's one over here. And now I'm going to do the same thing here in the dark areas. But guess what? You're going to brighten it. No, I'm going to darken it. Darken it, okay. Okay, and I'm going to add structure. I want those, those rocks to come out. And I'm going to copy that down the road. Okay. We need some over here. We need some here. We need some way back here. Okay. Now I'm going to go over here to, to under the tracks. Okay. See, I brought back. I have brought back the color of the leaves. I'm going to punch the structure up. I'm going to bring the saturation up. Maybe just a, a touch of, yeah, the warmth. I want to just get a hint of those leaves under the wheels there. See what I'm doing? Just like that. That's all I need, just a hint of those old dry leaves. Now, these four wheels, I'm going to treat different than everything else on this undercarriage. For these wheels, I'm going to select the wheel. I'm going to give it structure to bring out detail, and I'm going to desaturate it. Okay? And I'm going to shrink that size down a little. And I'm going to do this to every single of these wheels. Okay. And that back one, I'm going to add 
a little bit of brightness to these back too because they're shiny. They should look shiny, don't you think? And there's a bit of shine on this wheel here and here. Okay? Now everything else in this undercarriage I'm going to treat differently. I'm going to go up here to the main steam pistons. You see that in my lower window down in the right-hand corner? See the blues and the silvers mm -hmm. and the rust? I'm going to enhance that by increasing the structure on that. Okay? I'm just going to copy this around on this steam piston because this is just way cool. It's just a cool train. Okay. And these black wheels here, these guys are going to get a little bit of shadow adjustments to bring out some details in them. See? And this guy here needs it too. All oh, that is just so cool. Okay. Now let's go to the inside of the boiler and add just not much because a little bit of this goes a long way there and it actually makes it look noisy. So you have to add a, a touch of contrast. And sometimes you can just do it with structure too, okay? And this tree needs darkened more. Because it's taking my eye off the train because the tree is becoming a problem, okay? I really like the effect of the road. I like that we brought the leaf colors out here from the fall leaves that are dead and frozen. We've desaturated the road. We don't need color there to take our eyes away from the train. We've enhanced the color of the, of the main steam pistons. Now we're going to work on the, the, the boiler, the outside boiler. And with this, the first tool that we're going to use is structure. See that? And I'm going to increase the saturation. and I'm going to simply walk this down the train. Down here it needs a little bit different treatment. Uh, this needs a wee bit more structure. Oh, boy, I wish I could see this train. Well, come up and I'll take you. I am going to get up there. I, I am. I think I'm going to brighten the coal car. And now I'm going to put one last control point here on the side of the car. I'm going to add structure because I want the textures. And I am going to slowly decrease the saturation on that. Yeah. And maybe bring up the brightness a bit, just a little, okay? Let's look at this, see if there's anything else that needs... I'm going to put an anchor point here, because my um, adjustment of this, this forward carry has brightened this up. Okay. So you're going to bring that back down. Yeah. Because it, it, it becomes a distraction. Like the tree back over here in the back behind the coal. You yeah, know. Well, um, they bother those, me too. Those are so far away. Let's look at those. Let's put a control point on there. <clears throat> And let's take some saturation away from that. You got to be careful because it becomes more of a blur than a tree. A little bit of this goes a real long way. There. Um, now, I've got one more thing that I need to do. You see these dark, oily areas here? Mm hmm. 
those need our special touch. Start right, right here, and I am going to darken that. See that? And I'm just going to walk this wherever there's dark areas, like right in here. There's some up here. I want to bring that contrast back. Okay. Now, do I want to add some brightness down here? Let's look at that. Yeah, that works pretty good. Yeah. Let's go back to these dark areas. I want to enhance those dark areas. Um, now, I would also take the time and clone this electrical line out. This line's too much of an issue. Okay. Well, let's say okay with this and take a look see at, at what we got for before and after. We did a lot of editing in this Viveza. Okay, so let's let's look at before and after. Look at the sky. You see what I've done to that sky? Mm -hmm. Look at the undercarriage of the train here. This almost comes out as a supporting subject now. It's separate from the boiler. It has dimension. The, this whole training is taken on a three-dimensional feel. Before. See how that undercarriage just pops out at you now? Oh, I like this. I love how this train turned out. I really do. Could you have backed any further away from the train? I would have been in a little creek. Was there anything behind you you could stand on to get a higher viewpoint, a higher vantage? Oh, well, I had threatened to take a ladder. Okay. Don't you have Neos so you can get in the water? No, it was I frozen. Almost. The water. You could have walked on it then. I That's said almost. Right. Okay. But, um, no, I threatened to bring a ladder because those wheels were at least five feet. I mean, this was a humongous, All this right. was a humongous train. All right. We're not done yet. It's just, it's just gorgeous. Now we're going to bring up Color Effects Pro one last time. I just want to look and see if it can further enhance this image. What are we going to? Um, we are going to, I'm going to start with uh, color contrast range first. I'm going to move the slider. It's probably going to be way overdone for my likes. Yep, it is. Don't like that. I'm going to go to tonal contrast. See what tonal contrast has done to the train, but n not much else? I can't. I'm not getting a good feed at this moment. Okay. So and I can't tell. I'm going to bring the highlights down. Okay, because I just don't want anything in that sky. Now let's play with the midtones, which is the, the boiler and the trees. So let's look at the shadows. Oh, boy, did that That's ever it. The boy, shadows. That. Now, let's do before and after. Oh, yeah, that, that really aided. Now, let's add a filter and see. Um, let's try detail first. We probably don't need any. One of my favorite filters. Actually, a little bit of detail does further enhance that train a bit. Even that's probably too much. Uh, 
All right, let's go with that, and then let's look at our white neutralizer to see if that improves our image. And it actually, it improves the sky. Do you see that? No. The sky becomes a, a constant baby blue, but it adds a blue tint to everything else, so I'm going to say no to that. So we're just going to go with what we did. Mark, would you consider maybe doing a little bit of a graduated filter for the sky if it was... Mm -mm. You, you could. I think... But, mm. so, so this is... I'm just thinking this is that all I tried that. Subjective. No, no, it's not that it's, it wouldn't be nice. It's just I tried that, and it seemed to make the sky wacky. All right, so let's turn this on and off. Look at how that boiler just glows. So we can put some glamour glow on it. <laughs> no, no. That's that just would, junky. That would soften it. The only thing that I find horridly distracting to these lines, but yeah. you know, they're the bear, you know, and they're going to get you here, so. Oh, I do like this. So let's take the layers, let's merge them down. Let's save this as a PSD. So you always flatten yours? Uh, I, I do because I'm going to send it back to you and it's too big to send over the internet. What's the name of this engine? Steam engine. Oh no, there's got to be a name on it somewhere. It's in a Mexican, we couldn't find it. It's, in, it's, in a, it's from Mexico because I put it on the, um, the railroad section. Mm-hmm. And someone that got the information that it was some kind of steam engine from the 1930s or 40s from Mexico. That's all I know. All right. So that's saved on my desktop. It better be saved on my desktop. Where did I save that at? Oh, God. I saved that in the iPad directory. <laughs> so it's your image now, huh? It, well, no, it's 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 the full size image. It's just in the iPad directory now. Let's say a small version of it for you. We're going to put that on the desktop where it's supposed to be. Change it into a JPG. Save it. Okay, so that's done. That's done. We are done with Photoshop. Now let's go to the iPad directory and move that other one out of there. PSD, see? Put that on the desktop. Did that move to the desktop? I don't know. Okay. Stop the screen share. I'm back. Hi. Hi. Let me shrink me down and go to my desktop and see if I can find... So that's going to get trashed. There's your PSD. I'm, I'm, I'm going to delete your DNG. Goodbye, DNG. It's gone. So, question about raw uh, CR versus DNG. Oh, there's nothing wrong with the DNGs. It's, it's, it is a universal raw file. You're fine running it through a DNG converter. You really are. Now, my camera doesn't save CRWs or RAWs. It saves DNGs right in the camera. That's your... Both, both of the Leicas do that. The yeah, both my Leica does that, but... you're saying. Well, that's how we feel about you. We <laughs> kind of lost you there for a minute. 
Did I? Was I gone? Yeah. Oh. Okay. So that's just kind of, I don't know how I got into the habit of it, but I started set, uh, pulling things up through, um, through the bridge and just going directly into my uh, backup drive and saving everything that way, mm -hmm. as opposed to doing a catalog with Lightroom and all of that. Yeah, I don't, I don't use Lightroom catalogs. I do everything through Bridge. And I, get a, I just name a folder, and, and that's it. Yeah, let me show you uh, real quick. It's just another, just another thing, right? Always. Mm-hmm. Seems you learn something, you get rid of something else. You, you bet. All right. So let's go here. I got to think about where I put these. Okay. If I go to my Macintosh H drive, I go to users, I go to me, I go to pictures. I go down to raw image library. Okay. <clears throat> All right. This is my 2004 raw images, my or my 2014 and my 2015. Now let me arrange this by name. And I want you to notice that I have camera names in here. iPhone, my scanner Epson V8850. M240, MM is for monochrome, Nikon 120, X-T1, and I have an, X, an infrared and IR X100S. Okay, these directories with months are videos. Okay. Um, if I go into in M240 directory, then it's further subdivided by month. Okay, if I go into the month, then if you look at my files, let's go into this. Okay, this is the file name of my raw files that are brought into my computer. M240 camera name, the four digit serial number the camera assigns, and then I have my shutter speed defined in there, and I do that for a very specific reason. And then a job code. This picture was taken on my California trip on Tuesday. As we go on down here, okay, um, I have other job codes. This is just California, California, San Francisco. Okay, these are my raw files that are brought into the computer from the camera memory card. These are not the, the file names as named by the camera. Have you noticed that? Mm -hmm. I have a utility <clears throat> called Ingestomatic right here. That will read my camera. Memory card okay. will rename everything, build the directory structure if it's not already there. Now it's September. It will put the September directory in for me. When the years change, it will automatically change to 2016 and start building all of those structures again automatically for me. <clears throat> this is my primary root directory. This is where at my raw library starts. Users, Mark Hilliard, pictures, raw image library and capture. Underneath that, oh, and it also will back up to external drives, up to two of them at, at one time while you're reading them in. It'll make backups for you. <coughs> Underneath that, I have a folder arrangement that I have programmed here with tokens. And it gives us macro tokens. We can choose these things to, to, to 
change the file name, change the folder names. We can use any of these things, okay? So under, under my raw library capture, the very first thing that I have is it makes a directory of the year. This is my 2015 directory. If it's not there, it makes it. Then it looks up the camera model number in the image file itself. And it makes that the So those of you who shoot multiple cameras, this is a way to set up your raw library by the camera. And then the next thing it does is it puts the, the, the three character month code in. August. Now into this, or September, okay, into this it's going to drop the camera files into this August directory, but it's going to change the name of the camera files intelligently. It's going to look up the, the camera model, and so the very first thing it will say is Leica M240. Then it's going to put a dash in, and then it's going to take the original file number of that file, and it's going to clip everything else off and throw it away and put that file, that four-digit file number, in here because it's that four-digit file number that we use to organize our images. And then I've told it that I want uh, the shutter speed. Okay, so I've told it dash speed. Then I said look up the exposure time in the file. It go gets it for every file. And then it's going to tack on a job code. It's going to prompt me for this job code every time I upload a memory card into my computer so I can give it some specific that tells me where I shot at. And then it's going to put the four-year date, uh, the numerical code, 2015. The reason I do that is sometimes we can shoot so many images that, and the camera can only count up to 9,999 and then it rolls over to zero again. If it does that without this uh, four-digit year code, you don't know how to go back and find the correct raw file. So I tack this on. Okay, I tell it to geotag, so I I I, can, I have a little portable GPS unit I I carry around with me. So in a breadcrumb trail from the GPS unit to my smartphone, then it emails it to me here, and when I start this program, I point it at that file. Okay? And then it reads the files in, drops them in that raw library. Okay? It's, it's really, really a great utility. Okay, these are the GPX files. Okay, so let's go back to California. Let's, let's look at my California trip. Here I am in California. Okay. Here, well, let's look at this path right here. This is the trip that I took that day where I took pictures. I started out here at the hotel. Oh, this isn't California. This is, this is North Carolina. What am I doing? Well, we can do North Carolina. This is still my motel. This is where I took those shrimp boat pictures. Okay, I, I drove the car across the bridge, around the lake, okay, over here to where the shrimp boats are, are docked. And then you can see as I walked around where those shrimp boats are. See my path? Mm -hmm. And what it does is every 10 seconds it takes a lot long and it time stamps it and puts it in this file. And when this utility reads those lat long files in, it looks at the time stamp of your image, it compares it to the time stamp of the GPS file, and then it takes that GPS lat long and it stamps it inside your image, so it geocodes it. So you can look at your image and always know where you were when you took that picture. Um, I like it. 
Anyways, this little utility is called Ingestomatic. It's available for both the Macintosh and IBMs. I believe it costs $25. Um, there is a learning curve to it because you have to program these macros. All right, and programming is simple. You just go get it and copy it over here, okay? But it's very, very powerful. Um, I have a DVD tutorial set that I sell that has an entire chapter on setting this program up. You guys don't have to buy that. I will pull that chapter out and post it in our, on our Arcanum webpage for you. Cool. Okay. So that's how I set up my raw library, okay? Um, my edited files are set up just a little bit differently. But I have two complete libraries. I have my raw life, my raw library, and I have my finished picture library. Okay. And that's set up by uh, the year as well, but then it, it's then it goes it delves down into subject matter more. Like I'll have a directory for birds, avian, and then under that I'll have multiple subdirectories for each kind of bird. You know, um, it's it's much more intuitive for finding files on the fly. So that's just a a not so quick overview of my workflow. And as I said when we started this, everybody has their own workflow. I don't want you to copy me. But if you can pull out bits of what I do and see where maybe that will help you, um, then, then you're way ahead. All right? Okay. All right. So let me stop the broadcast.